There's nothing like being a member of a crew to make you realize just how important teamwork is to pull off a mission like this. Uh, it's really our pleasure to be able to come back at the uh, completion of the mission and be able to share some of the things uh, that went on, the things that we were able to experience, the things that we were able to do um, with all of you because we wouldn't have been able to experience them, we wouldn't have been able to do them without all of your help. And each and every person here and everyone that's listening um, contributes to the mission in, in some way, just as uh, each of us contributed in some uh, small way to the success of the mission. This mission was absolutely awesome. Uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of uh, all of you for the hard work that you did, echoing Mr. Abbey's uh, comments about uh, how you were working under adverse conditions with the, uh, the threat and the specter of the furlough uh, hanging over your heads. Uh, you were able to pull off just an incredible, incredible mission. The things, uh, things you're able to do, I don't think you appreciate just how great they really are. And I'm also extremely proud of the, the crew that I was able to be a part of uh, to go up and do this. Uh, each of these guys was a, is a pro from top to bottom. Uh, they dedicated the last year of their lives to making sure that this all worked, just as many of you have. Um, and I'm extremely proud of all of them. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of things we'd like to share with you today. We, we have about a 15-minute video that we put together uh, that will highlight some of the uh, uh, parts of the mission. We'll actually tell the story of the mission from start to finish, uh, catching some of the highlights. Unfortunately, we can't capture everything. Uh, it would take too long. Uh, we'd like to follow that up uh, with a few um, still shots that we have from different things that went on inside the cabin and also uh, for some uh, things that went on outside of the cabin, and we'd like to share those with you uh, as well. So if we can go ahead and, uh, and get the, the video rolling, we'll go ahead and get started. One of the first things we did when we come together as a crew to learn to work together, I guess, is to design a patch, and um, we tried to capture all of the major events that are on the mission in our patch. This was our design. About three days before liftoff, we started out on a crystal clear cold morning on our trip from Houston to Florida. It was uh, a beautiful day, about 6.30. Just wanted to show you what it was like to roll down a dark runway, feel the excitement as we started a 700-mile leg of what was ultimately a 3.7 million mile trip. And I can just remember the, the excitement in my heart, and the thrill to to lift off of uh, the dark runway and pop up into the sunlit sky. As Dan mentioned, it was the start of what was uh, to turn out to be an incredible journey. And three days later, after we'd gotten to the Cape, uh, it was time for us to go to work. January 11th, shortly after midnight, uh, the crew started getting ready in the uh, suit-up room. Uh, here you see the pilot on the mission, Brent Jett, a Navy flyer, was here getting ready for his first flight. Koichi Wakata, whom you've met, uh, joins us from Japan uh, as a mission specialist. Here he is preparing for his uh, first mission as well. Uh, the other experienced space flyer on the mission, Dr. Leroy Chow. Uh, you can see Leroy was ready to go. He had a lot ahead of him, and he was very anxious. Winston Scott, Navy captain, who is going to be the flight engineer on the mission, also a future spacewalker along with Leroy. Uh, here he is in his preparation, setting up his uh, microphones and his comm carrier. Last and certainly not least, Dr. Dan Barry, another future spacewalker. <laughs> and you can tell by the look in his eyes, he is ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> While we were getting ready, the, the vehicle was undergoing its final preparations. And then when we got to the launch minus three hour point, it was time for us to uh, depart the crew quarters where we'd been and walked out, and we were greeted by many of our friends. Some of you are here today, and we appreciate you coming down to wish us well on our journey. We boarded the, uh, the crew astro van there for the 20 minute or so ride out to the launch pad to get ready for the ascent, and I believe this pretty much speaks for itself. We have a go for entry. Ignition and liftoff of Endeavour in pursuit of a Japanese satellite. Houston, NASA, controlling. One seven, one eight, and roll. Roll program, Houston. Roger, roll, Endeavour.
contrast to the uh, vibration and noise during first stage on the solid rocket boosters, uh, the ride during the second stage on the main engines is uh, smooth all the way to Miko. Once on orbit, uh, we had to concentrate on our first major objective of the mission. That was the retrieval of the Japanese uh, Space Flyer Unit, or SFU, satellite. Here you see a good shot of the SFU and it's with its solar arrays deployed. Uh, it was critical for these solar arrays to be retracted and latched prior to the SFU's retrieval. And as we closed inside of a half a mile of SFU, you can see Brian firing the jets, uh, primary RCS jets, to slow down Endeavour's closure rate on the satellite. Meanwhile, Koichi and Winston are in the front uh, cockpit, part of the cockpit, monitoring the solar array retraction, which didn't go very well. Due to the fact uh, that we didn't have latching indication of the solar array panels of the SFU, the Sagamihara Operations Center located in Japan sent commands to jettison the two solar arrays to safely return the SFU to Earth. Brian maneuvered the orbiter to a distance within the grapple range of the shuttle's robotic arm. And then I started <coughs> to maneuver the robotic arm to grapple the SFU. This is the moment of the capture of the SFU, and uh, this was the end of the 10-month voyage of the space flight unit since it had been launched by a Japanese H-2 rocket uh, last March. You can see Koichi uh, concentrating here as he gets ready to, to uh, berth the satellite. After grapple, the SFU was uh, maneuvered to, to be berthed in the payload bay. Looks like he was ready to slam dunk that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then orbiter's electrical power was supplied to the SFU's uh, heater system uh, through this electrical umbilical. And it was a great moment, excuse me, it was a great moment uh, to have accomplished the first of the many uh, objectives of this mission. Even though the space flight unit was our primary satellite, to deploy and retrieve a second satellite, the OST, was equally exciting. OST is the Office of Aeronautics and Space Technology satellite. It consisted of four experiments which were really pretty much autonomous once we released it. And you can see Koichi uh, working the arm here. Actually, you can see the arm and Koichi is flying inside. He releases it and it's going to go into uh, a pirouette maneuver to check its automatic uh, control system, its attitude control system. Now, when we were inside the shuttle, of course, we were thinking about how the satellite was going to perform, which is a very technical thing. It was only after I looked at the film afterward that I could reflect on really the majesty uh, of the satellite. And watch when the Earth comes into view at the lower left-hand side <coughs> as the satellite uh, does its turn. Then you're going to see the sunlight hit it again, reflecting off of its gold coating. I think it's really something. Brent's flying the orbiter, Koichi's working the arm, Dan's taking pictures, everybody's pretty busy inside, but I tell you, it was really an exciting time. We're backing away from this thing, and again, you're gonna see a nice view of the Earth below. Incidentally, this picture of this deployment took place over the Namibian desert in the southern part of the uh, African continent. And take a look at the clouds, take a look at the synthetic objects flying over the natural objects below. I think it was out of sight. Here we are getting ready for the first of two EVAs. <clears throat> Dan Barry is helping me getting into my lower torso assembly. And you can see that uh, in zero G, even getting in your EVA pants can be done two legs at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are about to come out on the first EVA. I'm uh, opening up the thermal cover and uh, taking my first peek outside. Uh, I was prepared for an awesome view, but <clears throat> I didn't expect to uh, really get uh, what, I, what I got, which was a big 3D perspective because of all the, the peripheral vision uh, effects coming in. Here, Dan saying, "Hey, let me out too." <laughs> Come and speak. So you <laughs> Here we are putting together the portable work platform, one of the major objectives of the first EVA. That'll be used in uh, future station build flights. And uh, here, Dan is pass. I'm passing up to Dan the portable uh, foot workstation stanchion, and he'll put that onto the arm. 
Here we've deployed the uh, rigid umbilical, which was another big piece of hardware that we were using. And you can see I'm handling this 250-pound mass pretty much uh, with, with no problems at all. I think that the essence of a successful EVA is, is really the same as, as what Brian mentioned for the rest of space flight. And that word is really teamwork, um, both uh, inside the, the bay with Leroy and I, and also with Brent and Koichi as they flew the arm, and also with Houston as we coordinated all the diff difficult tasks we had to do. Brent and Koichi were able to drive the arm to the place that Leroy and I needed to be at precisely the time that we needed to be there. This was really the high point of the mission for me, both figuratively and literally, as Koichi drove me on the arm up high above the payload bay for me to test some of the work platform uh, techniques that we uh, had, had practiced. Uh, the second rendezvous of the mission uh, to retrieve the Earth satellite went extremely well. Uh, as we closed inside of 600 feet, uh, Endeavour was on a nearly perfect trajectory uh, to achieve the rendezvous. Brian, the commander, must have been feeling really comfortable about the whole thing. Um, he figures it's safe enough to even let his PLT fly for a little bit. <laughs> you notice the uh, expression on my face as I moved to the aft flight deck. Uh, it was a pretty exciting time for me to get a chance to fly the shuttle in uh, close proximity you know, to another spacecraft. Endeavour flies uh, extremely well. It's, it's, it's very stable. Uh, it flies uh, even better than the simulators we have here at JSC. And very soon, we were able to maneuver uh, OST within the grapple range of the robotic arm. The next view you're about to see is from the camera that's on the end of the robotic arm. It's the same view that Koichi is use, will use uh, to affect the capture of the satellite. And you'll watch, and once the satellite stabilizes, you'll see Koichi align the target on the satellite and then um, smoothly and quickly move in for the capture. And just like that, the man was two for two, and uh, <laughs> he very quickly had uh, two satellites uh, tucked safely in the payload bay. Now, EVA-2, like EVA-1, was six hours and 50-something minutes worth of hardware-intensive EVA. We were evaluating all kinds of tools and techniques that might be used in the uh, construction of a space station. Now, this looks like some kind of weird space exercise, but Actually, what I'm doing is imparting loads to the uh, task plate in which my feet are connected. <coughs> There's sensors in the bottom of that plate that will sense the loads and make recordings of that load's data. As I said, it was hardware intensive. We had electronic cuff checklists, power tools, rigid umbilicals, electrical fluid line connectors, uh, electrical connectors, fluid line connectors, improved helmet lights. You name it, we had it. We had stuff hanging off of us everywhere. We could set off metal detectors from orbit. <laughs> now, one of the highlights of this uh, EVA <coughs> was billed to be a thermal evaluation to test improvements to the suit, but it's time for the truth to come out. The truth is that I was a bad boy, and I was told to go stand in the corner. <laughs> so I stood in the corner and got cold all morning. I stood in the corner and got cold all afternoon. <laughs> and I stood in the corner and I got cold all night, and nobody would come out and play with me. <laughs> No, in all seriousness, <coughs> the thermal evaluation worked extremely well, and I think we've got a good suit and ready to go build the space station. Here we are at the end of the second EVA, and while I wait for Winston to uh, button up his slide wire, I've kind of climbed up the bulkhead and taken a peek inside to see what the guys inside are doing. And here we are coming in and uh, closing up the thermal cover and getting ready for the repress for the last time. Need to give that thing a good slam. <laughs> After two rendezvous, a deploy, two successful EVAs on flight day eight, we had some time to appreciate the beautiful views of the Earth, to take some film to bring back to show you all the depth of the colors and the, the beauty from, from our perspective. We also did some 
carefully controlled fluid dynamics experiments. <laughs> the commander said, you better get that, not make a mess of my orbiter. <laughs> Splattering coffee on the wall was an automatic airlock defrag. <laughs> Koichi and I also had an opportunity to play the ancient oriental uh, game of Go, and uh, we brought this, this along with us, really, to symbolize connections between past and present and between Japan and the United States. We could also experience how our body reacts to different kinds of motions in microgravity. As you can see, my smile decreases as spin goes on. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the master of karate, Winston Scott. <laughs> Look how stable his motions are, even though his feet are not attached to the floor. <laughs> it's uh, customary in Japan to mark the beginning and end of a large project by filling in the eyes of a Daruma doll. We had already filled in the eye of this Daruma to start the project, and here Koichi and I are getting ready after the retrieval of the SFU to uh, mark the completion of the project. One of the hardest things to do is to say goodbye to a view like this when it's time to come home. Uh, we all took our last gazes, uh, closed the payload bay doors, got in our suits, got ready for the deorbit burn. We burned north of Australia. Uh, an hour later, we were right here, approaching uh, KSC runway 15. We touched down about 2.40 in the morning. I imagine we woke a few folks up there in Florida with the sonic booms as we came in. Uh, as soon as the mains were down, Brent put the drag chute out, and that, that's our major deceleration device uh, during the rollout. Uh, at about 60 knots, he jettisoned it here, and if you'll notice, it falls pretty much straight behind the orbiter, so there wasn't much crosswind that day. And as we roll down the runway, we have those uh, bright lights behind us. You no watch me searching for the uh, center line here as I watch the nose move left and right, because we were about two miles away from those lights, and it was starting to get dark down there. And it's real important that you stop on the center line. It's the most, <laughs> most important part of the mission. <laughs> but at the end of at the end of that uh, incredible voyage, um, you know, we were able to, we're now able to look back on it uh, with uh, feelings of great accomplishment. We obviously owe our thanks to everybody that helped put the mission together and helped support the mission. Uh, it was uh, it was an incredible incredible trip. Uh, we can't capture all the certainly can't capture our thanks in words. We can't capture all of the the uh, scenes that we saw uh, on film. But we do have a few supplemental film uh, <coughs> shots now that we'd like to, to use just to show you some of the other things that went on during the mission. Uh, even though uh, we, ha we did have some pretty good rendezvous footage, one of the things we unfortunately did not capture on uh, video too well um, is shown in the lower left-hand corner of this slide. And you can just see the, the corner of the uh, IBM ThinkPad computer. But running on that computer is uh, a, a software program called the Rendezvous and Proxop program. And a lot of folks here at JSC uh, worked very hard to uh, develop and perfect that program. So it was a tool that uh, we used as a crew during the rendezvous, um, essentially to help Brian um, get a, a little bit better graphical picture of what was going on during the rendezvous and maybe what the orbiter was going to be doing in the next couple minutes. Um, we used this tool fairly extensively and it helped, uh, it helped on both rendezvous contribute to our um, fuel savings. We had a number of medical experiments um, on board to test uh, human adaptation to space flight. And here you can see I'm wired for sound. Actually, I'm wired for light. That's a laser on top of my head. And uh, we're testing how our, uh, our eyes and our balance systems uh, adapt and, and track as we go through the course of the mission. <laughs> I don't know how, the, as the doc on board, I ended up being the one that um, got stuck by needles from the pilot and had to pinch my nose, but somehow that was the case. And here we're testing um, uh, how oxygenation occurs uh, in the lungs that's different than uh, on the ground. Basically, there's a different distribution of blood and, and air in the lungs because of the lack of gravity up there, and um, you can see how relaxed <coughs> I am as we go through this GSO. Uh, we don't have a shower on board the orbiter, as many of you know, but it really wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> <We> didn't <laughs> he didn't really need to go all the way to those clips. 
Another one of the uh, secondaries that we had on board was called a urine monitoring system, and it was a hardware evaluation uh, of the box that was designed here at, at uh, the Johnson Space Center, and it's intended to be used on, on future long-duration space shuttle missions and also on the space station for uh, medical research. And it worked very well. Here you can see uh, I had to set up shop to run it there. I've got uh, things surrounding me, uh, large syringes and uh, uh, Unfortunately, none of the rest of the guys could use the bathroom when I was, <laughs> when I was doing this, so we, we had to plan everything <laughs> ahead of time. This is another uh, medical hardware evaluation. Um, I don't know how I got put in charge of this one as the pilot, but floating next to my, just above my hand, is a piece of hardware called the Portable Clinical Blood Analyzer, or PCBA for short. On long duration space flights, especially on station, um, it's, a, it's a tool that it will allow a doctor or the crew medical officer uh, to take a blood sample from someone who's not feeling well and, and get a quick analysis of their blood. Um, the two subjects on the experiment, I was the operator, uh, the two <laughs> subjects were uh, Dan and Koichi, and uh, they weren't real happy when I went to stick their fingers uh, and put their blood in that machine, but it worked real well and the folks here at JSC did a great job. Here's a picture of uh, living in space. Uh, once you get up into space, the ceiling and the floor quickly lose their meaning, and uh, you learn to use whatever space is available. Dan and Brian here are getting ready to prepare a meal, and uh, you can see the things stuck out on the, on the uh, Velcro patches along the walls and the, uh, the other surfaces. Here's another picture of uh, living in space. One of the questions we most frequently get is how do people sleep in space? Well, this is one option. You can see Dan in the foreground there in the sleeping bag. The purpose of the sleeping bag, of course, is only to keep your body from floating all over the, the cabin. You know, just, it, it, it really doesn't provide support as does a traditional bed. And you can see how his arms float up. It's really weird, but if you totally relax your body in space, your arms will float up in front of you in the, the manner that you see here on the, on the screen. Every morning, one of the first things uh, that we did after we woke up is to look through the uh, fax notes sent from the Mission Control Center in Houston. And uh, MCC always kept us informed of the updated schedule and uh, status of the orbiter and payload systems. I mentioned earlier that uh, we really enjoyed stealing glimpses of uh, beautiful parts of the Earth when we had a chance. Because of our launch time and our launch inclination, uh, we seem to get Australia uh, about every rev in the daylight, and we actually we clobbered it <laughs> with, <laughs> with film. Uh, we took a lot of shots um, uh, of the entire continent. Uh, it's extremely beautiful. This particular shot here is on the northeastern coast, and it's the city of Brisbane. And in the, towards the uh, left center, you can see the Brisbane River running down through the city into the, the bay. The bay was just an, an incredible assortment of beautiful blues, different colors. You can see some of the barrier islands there. And uh, uh, looking at Australia from the this barren Simpson Desert to the beautiful coastlines was uh, one great experience for us. This was something that I wanted to show you because it was a real surprise to me to, to see this. It, if you look up in the Texas summer sky at, at sunset, you'll often see the, the sun as it sets hitting the tops of the clouds. The top of the cloud is, is bright white. But from orbit, you get a different perspective. When that happens, as is shown here with the sun setting, and the sun hits the top of the clouds, they leave a shadow that stretches across the Earth for hundreds of miles. And this was a perspective I'd never seen before and I wanted to share with you. We had the pleasure of participating in a question and answer session from orbit with students from South Africa. And one of the things that captured my attention was the beauty of, uh, of the African continent. We got a picture of the Orange River that uh, is actually the boundary between Namibia to the north and South Africa to the uh, south. And again, the thing that really caught my attention at first was the, uh, the, the contrast in colors. You got the darker colors at the top that uh, represent the higher cultivated ground. And then you can see the results of erosion at the bottom where the brighter, more orange looking clay has uh, been <coughs> unearthed. And again, I just thought it was a very, very pretty picture. 
My guess this uh, technically isn't an Earth observation uh, picture, but it's, it's probably the favorite picture, my favorite picture of all the ones we uh, took on orbit. Um, this was taken during EVA-1, and you can see Leroy down in the uh, forward part of the bay on the uh, starboard sill working. In the background, uh, you can see uh, Sharks Bay, Australia, which is on the uh, west coast of Australia. Um, it's really, it's pretty interesting. I, I guess if I was, I happen to take this picture, and I guess if I was uh, talking to my photo instructor, Don, about this, I would try to tell him that I used a spot meter to meter the light in the payload bay and meter the earth and get the exposure just right so that both the payload bay and the earth were in proper exposure. And I think Don knows me too well. He'd probably say something about a blind squirrel and a nut. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it turned out to be a real nice picture, and uh, it happens to be my favorite. This is a real neat picture. Uh, this was shot in Brazil, about 120 miles northeast of uh, Rio de Janeiro. And it's interesting for several reasons. You can see the, uh, the mud from the rain runoff that has gone into the river that is uh, pouring into the ocean there. And you can also see the, uh, the scallops of the ancient shorelines as the shoreline evolved from centuries ago to its current. We could not see Mount Fuji because we launched the night uh, from uh, Northern Hemisphere. And this is a spectacular view of Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, you can see the vegetation area around Mount Kilimanjaro for a coffee plantation. Uh, I have to agree with Winston that about the African continent being so beautiful. And, and I really love it every time I see it. Um, in particular, I love looking at the deserts because you can see the dunes, uh, which actually uh, you can see uh, they're actually moving uh, on the surface of the earth. Uh, in this p particular picture here, uh, you can see a couple of things. One is the, uh, some of the, the hard rock, the lava left over uh, from uh, days gone by. And if you look in the, uh, towards the lower right center there, you can see there's an old crater there. But the deserts are reclaiming uh, that land as the wind erosion has uh, punched a hole uh, in the rim of the crater, and you can see the dunes and the sand filling in there, and it's probably just a matter of time until that's, that's all reclaimed desert. And that pretty much uh, sums up our, our mission. Uh, has the, the major events uh, we've been able to share with you, uh, some of the other things that we did on board. Uh, again, we'd like to thank, thank you for all that you did, and I have to tell you that, that you, make, you make incredible things uh, happen. And we, cer we certainly appreciate speaking on behalf of the crew, uh, having had the opportunity to work with all of you. We thank you for all you did in support of the mission. And we look forward to doing it again someday. Thank you. Thank you.